Morning. You guys doing good this morning? You awake? You enjoy the fall weather or what? Huh? Yes, this morning I'm excited to share with you a message called Neighbors. We'll be in Luke chapter 10. You can go ahead and turn there right now. We'll be starting with that. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. If you have your Bible, turn there. We're looking at the story of the Good Samaritan as we continue our Show Up September series. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along with me on the screen. Luke chapter 10, starting verse 25, says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to this place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of Roberts? The expert in the law said, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for every person that is here this morning. God, I pray you would open up our hearts, our minds for what you have for us. I pray you would speak through me, put things into my notes that need to be there, take things out that don't need to be there. And I pray that this would just be a a morning of encouragement and excitement. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, if you, if you don't know me, uh, like Pastor Jeff said, I'm Pastor Zach. I'm the middle school pastor here at New Hope. And uh, my wife and I, Maren, she was just leading worship up here. Uh, we this last year just had a baby who actually turns one in just over a week, which is crazy how fast that time goes. But one thing that we've discovered that our family loves to do is we love to take family walks. Anybody else like to take a walk outside? Especially like this beautiful weather, you put a sweatshirt on, you go outside. One of our favorite gifts that we got when we Uh, had our baby was this big jogging stroller. So we load up Barrett into the stroller. We got our dog, our golden retriever that we get on the leash, and we go on this walk. One thing that you'll find if if you haven't had babies, and if you have had a baby, you know this to be true, is that babies just attract people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you'll be walking down the sidewalk, and all of a sudden someone like pops out of the bush and like, can I see your baby? And it's just like, where did you come from, right? And everyone wants to see and like touch your baby, and you're like, gross, don't touch my baby. Uh, but, but people just, they love babies. And it, this morning, if you're struggling to make friends, let me encourage you, invest in a stroller, okay? <laughs> just put a blanket over it. Someone comes up and they're like, hey, can I see your baby? You're like, oh no, he's sleeping right now, right? Yes, you lied, but you also just made a great friend. So <laughs> invest in a stroller, you're welcome for the friends to come. Uh, but if you've ever moved into a new neighborhood, if, if you moved into a new house, uh, you are, you know, you're outside, you're moving in, your neighbors, you come and they come and they meet you and they're like super nice and outgoing and so friendly and the whole time you're thinking like, what are you trying to hide? Like, I, I know something, you're, you're not really this nice. So, like, what are you hiding from me? But, but maybe you've had that conversation with someone uh, when you moved in or maybe uh, they moved in and you're talking to them and it always ends with this phrase. Well, welcome to the neighborhood. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? Welcome to the neighborhood. And as soon as you hear that, you feel accepted. You're like, all right, sweet, I'm welcomed here. I belong here. This is my new home. But I started to wonder, is everyone welcome to the neighborhood? Is everyone, like, we all know that one neighbor that we're thinking of, and you're like, really? Like, does the whole neighborhood think the same? Like, really, are they welcome to the neighborhood, that person? Uh, Growing up at my parents' house, uh, the same house that they live at right now, it was a great neighborhood to live in. There's bike trails, 
all over the place. Uh, there's a park right there in town. There's all sorts of kids in that neighborhood. The, the baseball field was just a bike ride away from their house. It was awesome. But the best part of living there was one of my best friends, Jeff Kruger, lived just down the street from me. And there was lots of weekends, lots of summers of riding bikes back and forth, hanging out at each other's houses. But what I realized is that not everyone was as nice as Jeff Kruger and his family. Not everyone was as loving as Jeff Kruger and his family. You see, growing up there lived this, this bully on the block, and this bully would beat me up almost every day. Her name was Sarah. <laughs> Just kidding, but we had this, we had this neighbor, uh, if you know where Pastor Courtney lives, uh, he lived in that house before she moved in. Um, this neighbor, had, his name was Jay, and he had the biggest yard on the cul-de-sac. And when we were younger, he would let us play in his yard, do whatever. He had kids that were older. But all of a sudden, something switched, and he became one of those people, and maybe you're this person, where like his yard became a small idol in his life, right? You know the people I'm talking about? Maybe if that's, you, if that's you, like your husband, just give me a little quick hands up, right? I see some hands, okay? But this idol, like this yard became a small idol, and was, he would get mad at us whenever we would go into his yard. And I started to wonder as a kid, or I started to think, I don't really view Jay as my neighbor. I view him more as my enemy. Jay's my, he's my enemy. And, and I start to wonder, because I've heard in church, you know, love your neighbors. Think, okay, well, it's easy for me to love Jeff Kruger and his family. But do I have to love everybody? Does everybody deserve my love? Does Jay deserve my love? Is, is he my neighbor? Jesus, who exactly is my neighbor that you're talking about? This is a question that's been talked about for many years, and uh, we're going to look more into this question today, looking at our, our verse in, in Luke chapter 10. We see that Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience, uh, and, he, and he begins to tell this story, and, and there's this man in the audience who is an expert in the law, and scholars would say that, that he is a lawyer. And he says, hey, Jesus, uh, he tries to test Jesus. He says, hey, hey, good teacher, how do I inherit eternal life? Notice that he calls him good teacher. I want you to see this, that how you perceive someone is how you receive from someone. How you perceive them is how you will receive from them. He, he sees Jesus just as a good teacher. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus was a good teacher. He was a rabbi, but he was so much more than just a rabbi. Because last time I checked, uh, teachers aren't resurrecting, but rather Jesus came from heaven to earth. He died and he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he is God in the flesh. But this man, he asked Jesus a rabbi question, so Jesus gives him a rabbi answer. He says, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, obey the law. And then Jesus turns it back to him like he always does. And he says, how do you interpret the law? And, and this man says uh, something that is very profound here. He says, well, I think the law is summed up into two basic principles. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I grew up, like I said, in church, and I've, I've heard this about love everybody, love your neighbor as yourself, but what I've noticed is lots of people say, oh, I love everybody. I, I, I love everybody, but really what lots of people are saying when they say, I love everybody, is they're saying, I love everybody that looks like me, that talks like me, that acts like me, that thinks like me, and everybody else outside of that, I love them with the love of the Lord, right? which is really just Christianese for like, I can't stand that person's guts, right? Only to be followed up with like, oh, bless your heart, which is you're an idiot, right? We all know that. <laughs> but, but we see this, uh, this whole thing of love your neighbor as yourself. And this lawyer, uh, he, he's saying, uh, I think it's about loving God and it's about loving people. Jesus says, yes, do that and you will live. And then we see in verse 29, it says, uh, this expert in the law trying to justify himself. I want you to see that a religious spirit is always focused on yourself. It's always focused on what do I need to do? I, how, do how can I justify, him, justify myself? But understand this, that the gospel, grace, a relationship with Jesus says the work has already been done. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to justify yourself. It's already there for you. But wanting to justify himself, he says, Jesus, who is my neighbor? I just want to know who's my neighbor because I want to make sure that if I'm loving people, I want to make sure I'm loving the right people, that I'm not wasting my love on the wrong people. So, so just tell me, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Is Sarah from the block? Is, is she my neighbor? Is, is Jay my neighbor? Are Republicans my neighbor? Are Democrats my neighbor? Are sinners, are they my neighbor? What about heathens? What about people from other religions? Are they my neighbor? Jesus, I just want to know who is my neighbor. Classic Jesus, you ask him a question, 
he tells you a story, right? You know what I'm talking about. It, it, he tells this story. So he says, uh, there was this man going from Jerusalem to, to Jericho. So quickly we see that this would have been a Jewish man leaving Jerusalem. So we see that this traveler is going to Jericho. And while he was traveling to Jericho, he gets jumped. These guys jump out, they, they rob him, they steal everything, they beat him up, and they leave him to die. It says three different people walk by. The first is a priest. The priest, I think, represents the response of this is when we see a problem, we say, mm, that's not my problem. That's not, I, I didn't cause the problem, therefore I don't have to solve the problem. And I think if we're not careful, we can, we can walk around saying to different things, that's not my problem, when actually we have the answer for that problem. Understand this, that just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it's not your problem. Just because it's not our fault doesn't mean it's not our problem. There's, there's problems going on that we have the solution to. I don't want to be a church, I don't want to be a person that just walks by different problems saying, ah, I didn't cause that, uh, I don't have time for that, so I'm not going to solve that. But when I see something that I, that I jump at it and I, I take the chance to, to fix something, to help something out. But Jesus continues his story, he says, not only does a priest walk by, but also a Levite comes up, sees the man, and he continues walking. So what is a Levite? A Levite is an assistant to the priest, kind of like a, an intern sort of, a, sort of a deal. And I think that the Levite represents the response of, uh, I'm not qualified for that. I'm, I'm not qualified to solve this problem. And he actually probably thought something like this, uh, this seems more like a priest problem. And he continues walking. Unfortunately, this whole idea of being qualified can, can creep into church. Where, where we want, we feel like, oh man, I need someone to pray for me. I'm going to go up and get prayer, but I need the pastor to pray for me. Or we, or we feel like we, we feel led to pray for this person. We, we're like, all right, God, I know you want me to pray for them, but you know what? The pastor is going to go ahead, and they're going to pray for them, and they're going to do a much better job than me. As if like the pastor is the only person with a direct line to heaven, right? Don't get me wrong. Any pastor here would be more than happy to pray with you, to pray for you, but understand that, that we are all equal. No one has a better line to heaven, but Jesus came from heaven to earth. Therefore, we all have the same direct line. We all start at the foot of the cross. God's grace is sufficient for us. It, his grace qualifies us. We're qualified to, to do this. So looking at this story, we see, uh, we see two, something amazing about these first two people. We see that there's this priest and there's a Levite. And what's crazy about it is that they both have titles. We see that a title, it, it indicates what you specialize in. A title indicates more simply what you do. For example, a plumber works on pipes. A carpenter builds stuff. A chef makes food. Uh, a, a lawyer interprets the law. A police officer enforces the law. A politician, they always tell the truth. Okay, it, it, this title indicates what you do. What I'm getting at here is that your title is attached to your task. Your title, it's, it's attached to your task, meaning that if you're unwilling to fulfill the task, don't carry the title. Your title, is, it's, it's attached there. Jesus, what, what, what I love about Jesus is Jesus is the Christ. Okay, Christ is not his last name. All right, if, that's, if you thought that, it's not like, hey, table for two for Christ here. No, Christ is who he, that, that's his title. Christ means Savior. So Jesus has the title Savior. He came to the world not just to carry the title, but to fulfill the task to save us from our sin. And what I love about Jesus is, is he's so different and unique from other gods, other religions, because Jesus didn't just come to be served, but he came to serve. He, he, he's a servant leader, and, and he fulfilled his task that was in front of him. But we have this priest, we have this Levite, and their job, it, it's serving people, it's helping people. And what a great opportunity in front of them. Like, it's just set up right there for them to do their job. Yet the problem is, is that this problem isn't theirs or they feel like they are not qualified to do it. And if we're careful, if we're not careful, we will look at the city of Des Moines and we will condemn it and we will judge it. And we'll, we'll look at the darkness that the city is in and we'll say, you know what? I didn't cause the darkness in the city, therefore I'm not going to solve it. You know, someone more qualified is going to come up and they're going to be able to take care of it. This is not my problem. But understand that that's not the heart, that's not the DNA of New Hope, but rather we realize that we are on a mission. That, that God has called us, that we are God's plan, that he puts us in different places on purpose, for a purpose. You are in your neighborhood, in your family, in your workplace for a purpose. God has a plan for you. My prayer for, for me personally is this, that my best sermon, my best sermon would not be uh, with a microphone on a platform, but rather 
every day how I live. If our, if our preaching is better than our living, then let me tell you, we're in trouble. But rather, every day that I live, that, I, that I'm a light to wherever I may be going. I, my, my prayer is that my best ministry wouldn't be on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night, but it would be how I live every single day, that I'd be a light to every opportunity that I can see. I want you to understand, New Hope, that, that there are people that you encounter every single day. They're hurting, they're broken, they've, they've run out from religion, they think that God's mad at them, but there you are. And it's, it's, it's our problem to solve because nobody else is coming. You don't have to wait till Sunday to be a servant leader. You've got a task. You don't have to have the title. You've got a task. Sermons on Sunday are great, but you know the best sermon? Monday morning when you walk into work. It's Tuesday when you're putting your kids to bed. It's Wednesday when you're in the grocery store and you see that person and you feel led to go pray for them. Let's be a light wherever we go. We should be a church that says, I don't care about titles because I've got a task. I was reading this article that my brother-in-law sent me, uh, and I want to just kind of set this up. Uh, I debated all week using this because it's kind of a harsh article that I read, and I didn't want you to feel like I was coming harsh at you uh, or that it was me just kind of condemning because this really spoke to me, and I really felt like this was something since it stood out to me that I wanted to share with you. But this article was written by an atheist, and he said, the title of the article is this, How Much Do You Have to Hate Someone to Not Tell Them About Jesus? How much do you have to hate someone to not tell them about Jesus? He said, my problem with Christianity is this, is that they think that if Jesus is the only way to heaven, if, if, if heaven is real and hell is real and Jesus is the only way to heaven, and knowing what hell would be like, why would you not try to save every single person, no matter how annoying you are, no matter how obnoxious it is? He said, I, if, if I saw you in the middle of the street and there was a truck heading your way, and I told you to get out of the way, and you said, I, I don't see it coming, I don't believe that it's going to hit me, no matter what you say, at some point after yelling at you, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tackle you and get you out of the way. Man, we need to be people where, where we realize that, yes, it might be uncomfortable now for us, but imagine how uncomfortable it will be for them for eternity. Man, it might put us in, a, in an awkward position right now, but man, someday we'll get to, to glorify God and we'll get to worship God with that person. We don't have, can you imagine being at the gates and, and you go in and, and because you were too afraid of what they would think, because it was too awkward to tell them about Jesus here on earth, at how awkward it would be up in heaven when you're standing on the other side and they come up and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. And they look at you and say, you never, you never told me. You, you, never, you never stepped out. How awkward would, would that be? Man, let's, let's live a life here without regrets. Let, let's live a life here where we're willing to, to reach out wherever it may be, however it may be. Worship team, if you would join me. So I see this, this question, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he says, let me tell you this story. There was this traveler going down, and he gets beat up, and he gets robbed, and, and he gets left for dead, and, and three different people pass him by. The first is a priest. You would think he would do something, but he just keeps walking. The next is a Levite. You would think he would do something, but the same goes for him, and he just keeps walking. But the third person was a Samaritan, and he stopped and he helped him. Now understand this, that when he said Samaritan, these people would have been put off by this. They would have been set back. They would have kind of cringed at, at the thought of, of this Samaritan because the Jews and the Samaritans were enemies. I just read this, this post the other day of, of if Jesus were to preach to us today the story of the Good Samaritan, what it might be titled. The super helpful immigrant, the generous Muslim, the kinder than you refugee, the holy atheist. Man, what, if you heard something like that and you hear, about, you hear about Pastor Weaver walks by and Pastor Luke walks by, but, and then this atheist comes by, you think like, no way, is, are they going to stop? But, but that's, that's kind of how they thought. See, under, understand the context that 900 years before this, Israel was subdivided into, into two different nations, and the uh, Syrians came into the northern part, and they conquered it. And them and the Jews, they, they intermarried, and they had children, and these children were called Samaritans. And the, so these Samaritans were a mixed race with mixed gods. The way that the Jews viewed the Samaritans was classic racism. I understand that racism, it's been around for a long time, but you want to know the solution to racism? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel. And when we see it, we need to stand up, we need to call it for what it is, and we need to present the solution. Just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it's not your problem. 
We see that this, this Jewish lawyer who, who knows the law, he, he's an expert in the law, is asking, hey, who, who is my neighbor? Jesus tells the story, the priest, the Levite, but of all the people to stop, it's a Samaritan. So it's a Jewish man beat up, left for dead, and it's a Samaritan, the lower class, to look down upon, the enemy of the Jew that stops and helps him. It says not only does he stop, but, but he has pity on him. And not only pity, but, but he goes and, and he, he gets down on the ground and he cleans him up, he bandages him up, he puts him on his donkey, he takes him to the inn, he pays two silver coins and says, hey, I'm gonna come back later and I'm gonna pay for, you, for this in full. I want us to see four different things that we can learn from the Good Samaritan of of how can we be a good neighbor? How can we be a a, a Good Samaritan to people around us? The first one is this. I hope that we can feel the pain. A Good Samaritan feels the pain. A Good Samaritan focuses on the pain. A Good Samaritan funds the resources for the pain. And a Good Samaritan follows through. I hope that we are a church that when we see our, our coworkers, when we see our neighbors, our, our family, our friends, that we would feel their pain. I, I, I hope that we would focus on it. Yet, no, you can't do everything, but you can do something. And some of us think that because I can't do everything, that gives me the right to do nothing. But you have, you have a solution. You, you, you have the answer to the problem. We, we fund the resources. You may be new here and looking around and saying, how is all of this funded? Well, we, we believe that we don't have to give, but rather we get to give. And through that giving, we see lost people reach. We see miracles happen. We see water wells, like Pastor Brian was talking about, water wells built in, in Africa. People are being saved. And lastly, I hope that we're a church that we follow through. Where it's not just something we get excited about on Sunday, but it is every single day of the week. Would you stand with me this morning? Jesus finishes telling this story. Classic Jesus, you ask him a question, he tells you a story, and then, then he turns in and he asks you a question. He says to the man, which one of these three was a neighbor to the man in need? And watch this. The lawyer, obviously challenged, obviously convicted, can't even say the word Samaritan. He says, I, I, I suppose it's the one who showed mercy. Jesus says, yes, go and do likewise. Isn't it funny that we ask Jesus a question, who is a good neighbor, and he shows us a picture? I wonder how many times we're asking the wrong question. I say, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he says, Zach, are you a good neighbor? Jesus, who do I have to love? Zach, are you loving everyone? Are, are, are you being loved? Isn't it amazing that, that when we start to build a relationship with someone, we get more of the story? It's easy to judge someone based off their Instagram story, based off what they post on Facebook. But when you sit down with them and, and you get the full story, you say, wow, I didn't know all the facts. I didn't know all that stuff. Now I know the way, why you do what you do, why you act the way you act. You're hurting, you're broken, therefore that's all you know how to do. You know why that person hurt you? Because they have been hurt. And what they need is they need a good neighbor that says you are welcome to the neighborhood. You are welcome here. You belong here. You know what the Des Moines area needs? The Des Moines area needs a church that says you are welcome here. It doesn't matter what your past is like. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't even matter what religion you've been in the past. You are welcome here. Welcome to New Hope. <laughs> Understand that that Jesus doesn't just tell us stories to inspire us, to challenge us to be better people or to, or to do gooder, even though that's not a word. Uh, he tells us these things because he wants to drive us to the end of ourselves. Watch this. The Lord says, how do I inherit eternal life? He says, obey the law. How do you interpret it? He said, love God, love people. And then he says, yeah, but who is my neighbor? Jesus tells him the story. You'd think the priest would. You'd think the Levite would. But of all people, your enemy, the Samaritan, he did it. And the Lord is going, yeah, but, but I, I can't do that. Love like that is right. I, 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 I can't even say the word Samaritan, let alone love him like that. What is Jesus doing here? He's trying to get us to recognize that none of us, here's me with my hand up, none of us are the good Samaritan in the story. We need to realize who we are in the story. I'm the traveler on the side of the road dead. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Sin, sin has come in and we've entered in this world and we've been chewed up and we've been spit out. We've been hurt, we've been broken by this world. And we're saying, Jesus, I can't love them. And, and he's saying, I know you can't, but I can. See, sin has, sin has come in and it's eaten us up. 
Chris Durso says a quote like this. You'll see it on the screen. It says this, sin is like being hustled into buying something. At first, you think you got the deal, but then you realize that the deal got you. Understand this, New Hope, that sin does not just make us bad people. We don't just not sin to be good people. Rather, sin, it makes us dead people. I was dead on the side of the road, and Christ came down. He kneeled down. He cleaned me up. He picked me up. He carried me. He took me to the inn. He took out his billfold. He said, here are two silver coins. It was a cross on Friday. It was a two-month on Saturday. He said, don't worry. I'm going to come back and I'm gonna, on the third day, and I'm going to pay it in full. We are the traveler, and we were broken, and religion had passed us by, self-help had passed us by, nothing could clean me, nothing could aid me, nothing could fix me from the inside out, but Jesus came, and because of this, we realized that we are not forsaken, we are not forgotten. Jesus, he loves you, he wants a relationship with you, and because of that, because he died on the cross for you, we worship him. My favorite part of the story is this, and, and this is for the church. We realize who we are in the story. We're the traveler on the side of the road. We realize that Jesus, is a good Samaritan. So you know what new hope is? New hope is the end. It's a safe place for anyone who has been hurt by this world, broken by sin, who is hurting, who is broken. I say we take all of them and we bring them in. We say, welcome to the neighborhood. Welcome to new hope. You belong here. You are welcome here. So this morning I want to end a little different with everyone, your eyes open, looking around. If that's you this morning and you're ready to start a relationship with Jesus, realizing that's the best decision you could ever make. Oh, feeling overwhelmed with love and grace. And, and you wanna give your life to him, maybe for the first time, maybe you're saying, I need to rededicate my life to him. I wanna do this with our eyes open because when you move into a new neighborhood, you don't move in overnight. You move in in broad daylight. It's loud. People know what's going on. They know you're here. But we don't want to say this. We don't want you to raise your hand and be like, oh, look at that person. No, but we want to celebrate you because this is the best decision you could ever make. So if that's you this morning, you're saying for the first time, or I want to rededicate my life to Jesus, I'm ready to, to come back into the neighborhood. I'm ready to, to enter into the family. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I see your hand. I see hands. Look around, see those hands. So we understand that we're the traveler. Jesus is the good Samaritan. I said, obviously we're not the good Samaritan, but you know what, we, are, we try to be like Christ. Therefore, we, we act like him. We, we try to be that good Samaritan. And any of those people with their hands up, that you looked around and saw, I don't want any of those people to go to lunch by themselves today. Not only that, but they shouldn't even pay for their lunch today. It's time that we be a good neighbor, we be a good Samaritan, and we feel the pain, we focus on the pain, we fund the pain, and we follow through. I'm gonna pray in just a second, but I wanna just encourage you, let's go out into the world and let's be a good neighbor. Let's go into the world and let's, let's be Christ-like. Let's, let's come to him recognizing that we are dead without him, that, that sin has made us dead, but Jesus can make us alive. Dear Jesus, thank you for every person here this morning, God. I thank you that you've brought them here on purpose for a purpose. For those who have responded this morning, I, I thank you for the decision that they made, that they would be welcome to the neighborhood, that they wouldn't be ashamed, but they would feel the love and the grace that you provide, and that we would celebrate in that, God. God, I pray as we go into our neighborhood, as we go into our workplace, into our, our families back home, I pray that we would be encouraged. I pray that you would give us ways to reach them, that we would not be like the priest or the Levite and walk right by, but we would recognize that we might have the answer to this problem. I pray you'd equip us, open our eyes to see new things. God, and I pray that we would worship you every day. Wake up in the morning worshiping you, go to bed worshiping you, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. In your name we pray, amen.